Hey, all of you sheepies near and far, Happy New Year, 2023, January 1st. New Year's Day. Welcome to worship whenever you have a chance to view this. So I thought it might be fun to do something just a little bit lighter for New Year's Day. We're going to be taking a look at some symbols of Christmas. And here, if you're, if you're joining us for worship live, we'll intersperse some hymns during the message. If not, you're just gonna to have to YouTube them and enjoy the meanings uh, behind the symbols. So let me pray us in. Holy God, as we step into a new year, we ask that you would continue to guide us just as you did the wise men. Change our heart and mold us into whoever you're creating us to be. Help us to follow you closely this year. And so God, as we look at these symbols of Christmas, help us to center upon you now and in the days ahead. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So throughout biblical history, God has used various symbols to reveal both his presence and love to his people. God has used everyday tangible things to remind us of himself. God has used these things such as a rainbow in the sky to remind us that his presence always is with us. He promised that he would never flood the earth again. His promise stands firm. Jesus often used symbols too. The most prominent, of course, is the bread and the cup. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Symbols remind us of things. And these biblical symbols remind us, of course, of God the Father and Jesus the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit that works in us and through us. God knows that in order for us to draw near to him, he couldn't use things that were not common. That just makes us zone out, or at least it makes me zone out when I, don't, I see things that are unfamiliar. How about you? It kind of pushes us away a little bit. And I love that Jesus used everyday, ordinary things that the people of Jesus' day would have known and understood. Birds and lilies and treasures and stuff from the Sermon on the Mount. And figs. You've heard me say our Jesus loved his figs. They were common. He referred to himself as the gate and the shepherd and the vine, etc. All those I am statements that we see in John's Gospel. We might be taking a look at those I am statements here in the next couple of weeks as we continue on with this symbol imagery. These were things that the people of Jesus' day understood. So I thought it might be fun on this New Year's Day to take a look at some symbols of Christmas. Next Sunday, we're going to take a look at a couple more symbols that tie in a little bit closer with Epiphany. The wise guys coming to the manger. I love me some Epiphany. The first symbol, the nativity. It's still up here at Ballotin UMC and it will be until January 8th when the wise men come. Often called the manger. The manger was more than likely a hollowed out cave of stone rather than a barn-like structure that we might envision. A cave would have been common for people to house their animals in in Jesus' day. And oftentimes, animals and people coexisted in the same place. Scripture doesn't mention anyone living in the place in which Jesus was born. But we need to remember that Jesus was born in a messy place. He is okay then with our messiness of life too. It wasn't sterile, this place in which our Savior was born. So what a reassurance it is for us that we don't have to clean ourselves up in order to approach our Lord. The very first nativity was constructed by St. Francis. I'm a fan of St. Francis of Assisi. In 1223, but his nativity consisted of live animals. St. Francis loved 
animals, and animals loved St. Francis. It also had people and a real, baby, a real baby. The actual manger or the feeding trough where Jesus lay was probably carved out of a rock too. It wasn't necessarily made out of wood, this feeding trough. The French pronunciation of manger means to eat. We are reminded again that Bethlehem means the house of bread. And of Matthew 26, 26, as Jesus breaks the bread, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, God, for the symbol of the nativity. The shepherds, Luke 2, 8 through 20. That night, some shepherds were in the fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel appeared among them, and the landscape shone bright with the glory of the Lord. They were badly frightened, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you the most joyful news ever announced, and it is for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. How will you recognize him? You will find a baby wrapped in a blanket lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God. Glory to God in the highest heaven, they sang, and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. When this great army of angels had returned again to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They ran to the village and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story expressed astonishment. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and thought about them often. Then the shepherds went back again to their fields and flocks, praising God for the visit of the angels and because they had seen the child, just as the angel had told them, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know that I love the shepherds. It's my favorite part of the Christmas story. Pastor Ryan Peterson, my colleague from Scandia Free Church here in Ballatin, calls us the sheep, the sheep herders calls the shepherds the sheep herders and us as pastors the sheep dogs of the shepherd. I love that, don't you? Here, the shepherds, they're just doing their job. They're just doing their job. They were faithfully tending the flock. And why do you suppose they were chosen rather than the Pharisees or the politicians or even the innkeeper? Again, God chose shepherds throughout biblical history to become his greatest leaders. Moses, Jacob, David, learned to be great leaders by first leading sheep. Shepherds knew how to respond quickly, immediately. They didn't get all worked up in a crisis. They just kept tending their sheep. They didn't need to study it or pray about it or consult the Levitical law book about it. When the angels announced the news, they simply went. I think King James Version tells us that they went with haste, meaning urgency or swiftness. Then what did they do? They told everyone about it, but they also went back to their sheep, just doing what they do. Thank you, God, for the shepherds. The angels, we can't have the shepherds without the angels. Hebrews 1.14 tells us, isn't it obvious that all angels are sent to help out with those lined up to receive salvation? And then Hebrews 13.2, don't forget to be kind to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Some translations uh, read entertaining angels unaware. The angels in the Bible are evidence that God is working. They are messengers of God. 
speaking, singing, caretaking, bringing joy, announcing God's presence. They often speak the words, fear not, because God knows that it is probably pretty scary when an angel shows up. One of my favorite passages is 1 Kings chapter 17. It's, it's the story of the prophet Elisha who is on the run from um, a crazy queen, Jezebel, and he is literally suicidal. God sends an angel to care for him and to give him strength to continue on the journey. Give it a read. It's a beautiful passage. We see throughout the Christmas narrative that one of the roles of the angel Gabriel was to give both John and Jesus their names. God orchestrated these names, divinely orchestrated. God was the one who named them. Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael are the three big archangels. We also see in the Gospel of Luke that an angel comes to minister to Jesus that night in the garden. What a beautiful sight. The earliest angel on top of a Christmas tree was documented in 1848 when a drawing titled Christmas at Windsor Castle was published in the London News. The drawing depicted Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children all gathered around a Christmas tree adorned atop with an angel. The drawing set a precedent for angel treetoppers, both in Great Britain and the United States. I think that I have angels watching over me. How about you? What do you think? You too. Thank you, God, for sending us your angels. The Christmas tree. You've seen our Christmas tree here at church on some of our recordings, the evergreen. Isaiah 60, 13 says, The great trees of Lebanon will be given to you, its pine, fir, and cypress trees together. You will use them to make my temple beautiful, and I will give much honor to this place where I rest my feet. I love that, don't you? Your trees will adorn my temple. So why an evergreen to be used for a Christmas tree? Well, an evergreen is never changing. Always green, even in the harsh of a winter, unless its needles are, are dying, it's always green. It re represents God's never changing, unending love for you and I. It is the promise of the abundant life in and through Jesus Christ. Along with that, we see the Advent wreath. You've seen our picture of the Advent wreath. That stays up too here at Ballotin UMC until after next Sunday. The Advent wreath has its evergreen branches bent in a circle, so the ends touch, having no beginning and no end. Just as there is no beginning or no end to Jesus' eternal love for us, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen and amen. Hollies and berries connected to the evergreen and pine. We don't hear about this symbol of Christmas as much in these days. We might find some holly and berries in Christmas crafts. Sometimes we hear about the holly and the ivy. I think there's a song, the holly and the ivy. This represents the crown of thorns upon Jesus' head as he was crucified. The berries symbolize his blood shed for us. He endured criticism, excruciating pain, the embarrassment, all for our sake. As we think about the holly and the ivy, we see that in the holly and the ivy, along with the evergreen, the needles point up. John 6, 33, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So we raise our hands in praise. Thank you, God, for all that you have given us. This greenery reminds us of the abundant life in and through you. Ornaments, decorations, that adorn our tree. 
Decorating our tree with ornaments comes from an old European custom when ornaments were made from cookies and bread. They were hung on the tree to give thanks for our daily bread. Through the years, these edible ornaments began to be made out of wood and blown glass as it evolved. People today look for that perfect ornament to decorate their tree. Even trees with decorating themes, Vikings fans have Vikings or coordinated trees, Packers fans as to not be left out. Gail Kaup and Ruth Gurnett's have a similar theme. We used to give our boys ornaments for Christmas. I think they are packed away, actually. I'm gonna to have to go through them at some point and see which ones the boys want to keep. I have some ornaments even back from when I was a kid. And my little Charlie Brown Christmas tree at the Parsonage is adorned with ornaments that you all have given me over the years. It's getting pretty full. Ornaments can symbolize blessings in our lives, that everything we have comes from God. We will run out of ornaments before we run out of blessings, my friends. And so we pray then together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Please join me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remember our blessings. Making cookies. Did you make some Christmas cookies? Jeremiah 18, 6, O Israel, can I not do to you as the potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand. I know that many of you are great cookie bakers, evidenced by your gifts to me. Yum, yum. Cookie baking is not one of my gifts. I do not do it well. And so I gave all my cookie cutters that I inherited from my grandma Chubby to our beautiful daughter-in-law, Amy. She does cookies well. When our kids were small and my niece and, and nephews, my mom would have all of the grandkids over to bake Christmas cookies and decorate. I know some of you do this with your children and your grandchildren, a holiday tradition. Making cookies is a favorite pastime in preparation for the holidays. It's turning ordinary dough into edible masterpieces. God doesn't use cookie cutters when he creates each one of us. He makes each and every one of us so special and unique that he would break the mold after just one use. But the mold still bears a slight resemblance to our ancestry with similarities in looks and even mannerisms and quirks. We are all part of the family of God. God molds us and shapes us into what he knows that we can become. He is the potter and we are the clay. Thank you, God, for the symbol of Christmas cookies that reminds us of you. Bells. I love a good church bell. We don't have one here at Ballotin UMC. Uh, those that have been around a long time say that we did. They don't know what happened to it at, at, at one point. It was taken off, I, I guess, years ago. When Pastor Daryl Toole and I were working together and we were co-leading Lenten services, whenever we would be out at Sillerud, then Marv Matson would come to me Instead, he Pastor Darrell before worship, and he'd say, should I ring the bell? Because he knew that I loved it, and he would climb the stairs up to the balcony where the bell tower was, and he would ring the bell. I love Sillerud's bell. Trinity, your bell's pretty good, too, as to not be left out. Bells say, listen, take notice. Bells alert people to something important about to happen. Bells announce Good news. 
A few weeks ago, I co-led the Horvath Service of Remembrance up in Marshall with uh, the priest from Holy Redeemer. And I was a little bit early, and so I sat in my vehicle, and Holy Redeemer is right across the street, and I listened. I just soaked up the bells as they were playing. It was beautiful. One of the first things that we see as we enter into the holiday season is the red kettle and hear the bells of Salvation Army ring during the holiday season. Not only does it provide for a good cause, but it reminds us that we are to be soldiers for the Lord. It is our call to let this good news of Jesus ring out and bring lost sheep into the fold. We hear clock bells and dinner bells and school bells. Bells remind us to be grateful. Some famous Christmas movies involving bells. The bells of St. Mary's, Silver Bells, and It's a Wonderful Life. I hope you take a look at all three of those because they're all great movies. The candy cane. Of course the candy cane reminds us of Jesus. Originally, it was not in the shape of a J or a shepherd's staff, but they were straight, just a straight stick. In 1670s, they were called, yeah, in 1670, they were simply called sugar sticks and were just white, not even flavored yet, just, just the white, tasted like pure sugar. The stripes were added about 200 years later. And then flavors, peppermint and wintergreen, were added in about 1900. So that's, what, not that long ago that the peppermint and wintergreen were added. Today, candy canes come in all kinds of flavors. The confirmation kids like the Jolly Rancher ones best, at least this year. Who knows what next year is? They're not too fond of the cinnamon red hot ones. So Christmas, the word Christmas comes from two Latin words, Christus and Missus, which means Christ is sent. Sent where? sent into the world by his loving father, who just like Hallmark, only wishes to give his children the very best, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And all God's people say, amen. Next week, we're gonna do round two of the Christmas symbols, more so with Epiphany. So we'll look at the star, we'll look at gifts, We'll probably look at Santa Claus. We'll look at, at Christmas lights. So it'll be kind of a continuation. I hope you enjoyed this one. You'll have to scroll on Facebook or YouTube to get some songs that go with the message. Happy New Year. Watch for the storm coming in on Monday and stay safe. Jesus loves you. So do I. Bye for now.